you are about to listen to the one of the greatest short stories ever written. Anton Pavlovich Chekhov is a brilliant Russian writer, talented playwright, and short story genius. His unique sense of humor that saturates his masterpieces won't leave you indifferent. His works have become classics of world literature, and his plays are staged in theaters around the world. Anton Pavlovich Chekhov Rothschild's Violin The town was small, worse than a village, and almost only old people lived in it, who died so seldom it was even annoying. Very few coffins were needed in the hospital and prison. In a word, things were terrible. If Yakov Ivanov was a coffin maker in the provincial town, then probably he would have his own house and his name would be Yakov Matveich. But here in the town, they simply called him Yakov, and for some reason his street nickname was Bronza, and he lived poorly, like a simple muzhik, in a small old hut where there was only one room, where he, Marfa, the stove, a double bed, coffins, a joiner's bench, and all the household fit in. Yakov made good, durable coffins. For muzhiks and merchants, he made them to his own height and never had a mistake, since there were no people taller and stronger than him anywhere, even in the prison castle. Although he was already 70 years old, for the nobles and for women, he made them according to measure and used an iron arshin for this. He accepted orders for children's coffins very reluctantly and made them directly without measurement, with contempt, and every time receiving the money for work he said, frankly, I don't like wasting time on trifles. In addition to coffin-making skills, playing the violin also brought him a small income. In the town, a Jewish orchestra usually played at weddings, led by the tinker Moisei Ilyich Shakhez, who took over half the profit for himself. Since Yakov played the violin very well, especially Russian songs, Shakhez sometimes invited him to play in the orchestra, paying him 50 kopecks a day, not counting gifts from guests. When Bronza sat in the orchestra, first of all, his face became sweaty and purple. It was hot. It smelled like garlic to the point of suffocation. The violin squealed. A double bass whizzed at the right ear. At the left, a flute was crying, played by a skinny red-haired Jew with a whole web of thread-like red and blue veins on his face, who bore the surname of the famous rich man Rothschild and this accursed Jew managed to play sadly even the merriest tunes. For no apparent reason, Yaakov gradually became filled with hatred and contempt for the Jews, and especially for Rothschild. He started to quibble, began to find fault, scold him with bad words, and once even wanted to beat him. And Rothschild was offended and said, looking at him fiercely, If I did not respect you for your talent, you would have flown in my window a long time ago. Then he cried. That's why Bronza was invited to play in the orchestra not very often, only in case of emergency, when one of the Jews was absent. Yakov had never been in a good mood because he constantly had to suffer terrible losses. For example, it was a sin to work on Sundays and holidays. Monday was a hard day, and thus there were about 200 days a year when, involuntarily, one had to sit back. And that was such a loss. If someone in the city played a wedding without music, or Shakhez did not invite Yakov, then that was also a loss. The police warden was ill for two years and languished. 
and Yakov was impatiently waiting for him to die. But the warden went to the provincial town for medical treatment and died there. Here was the loss again, at least ten rubles worth, since the coffin would have to be made expensive with an eyelet. Thoughts of losses plagued Yakov, especially at night. He put a violin next to him on the bed, and when all sorts of nonsense climbed into his head, he touched the strings. The violin made a sound in the dark, and he felt better. On the 6th of May last year, Marfa suddenly fell ill. The old woman breathed heavily, drank a lot of water, and staggered. But still in the morning she heated the stove and even walked for water. By the evening she took to her bed. Yakov played the violin all day. When it was completely dark, he took a book in which he wrote down his losses every day and, out of boredom, began to sum up the annual total. It turned out to be more than a thousand rubles. It shocked him so much that he hit the floor with the abacus and stamped his feet. Then he picked up his abacus and again clicked for a long time and sighed deeply and tensely. His face was purple and wet with sweat. He thought that if these missing thousand rubles were put in a bank, then the smallest percentage would accumulate a year. Forty rubles. This means that these forty rubles were also a loss. In a word, wherever you turn, everywhere there are only losses and nothing more. Yakov cried Marfa all of a sudden. I'm dying. He looked back at his wife. Her face was rosy from the fever, but unusually clear and joyful. Bronza, accustomed to always seeing her face pale, timid, and unhappy, was now embarrassed. It looked as if she were really dying, and was happy that she was finally leaving this hut forever far from the coffins, from Yakov. And she looked at the ceiling and moved her lips, and she looked happy, as if she saw death, her rescuer, and whispered to her. It was already dawn. Through the window you could see how the first light was burning. Looking at the old woman, Yakov, for some reason, remembered that all his life he had never caressed her never pitied her, never thought of buying her a headkerchief or of bringing sweets from the wedding, but only shouted at her, scolded for losses, rushed at her with his fists. Truly, he never beat her, but still he frightened her, and every time she was numb with fear. Yes, he did not let her drink tea because the expenses were already high and she only drank hot water, and he understood why she now had such a strange, joyful face, and he became terrified. After the morning came, he borrowed a horse from a neighbor and took Marfa to the hospital. Few patients were there, so he did not have to wait long, only three hours. To his great pleasure, this time the doctor was not the one who himself was ill, but the felcher, Maxim Nikolaevich, an old man about whom everyone in the city said that although he drinks and fights, he is better than the doctor. We wish you good health, said Yakov, leading the old woman into the waiting room. Excuse me, we keep bothering you, Maxim Nikolaevich, with our petty affairs. Here, if you please, my object fell ill. The companion of my life, as they say, excuse the expression. Furrowing his gray brows and stroking his whiskers, the felcher began to look at the old woman, and she sat hunched over on a stool, thin, pointed nosed, with an open mouth, looking in profile like a bird who wanted to drink. Hmm, so... The felcher said slowly and sighed. 
influenza, maybe a fever. Now typhus is running around the city. Well, the woman lived her life, thank God. How old is she? Seventy, without a year, Maxim Nikolaevich. Well, the old woman had her life. It's time to go. Uh, of course, your remark is very just, said Yakov, smiling out of politeness. And I'm sincerely grateful for your kindness, but allow me to express myself. Every insect wants to live. Really? said the paramedic in such a tone as if it depended on him whether the old woman lived or died. Well, so, my dear, you will put a cold compress on her head and give these powders twice a day. Right now, goodbye. Bonjour. From the expression on his face, Yakov saw that things were terrible and that no powders could help. It was now clear to him that Marfa would die very soon, if not today, then tomorrow. He lightly pushed the paramedic under the elbow, winked his eye, and said in an undertone, Maybe Maxim Nikolaevich, she needs cupping therapy. I have no time, no time, my friend. Take your old woman and God be with you. Goodbye. Do such a favor, Yakov pleaded. If you please know yourself if, say, her stomach ached or insides well, then powders and drops, but she had a cold on her. With the cold, the first thing to do is to draw blood, Maxim Nikolaevich. But the felcher had already called the next patient, and a woman with the boy entered the waiting room. Go, 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 he said to Yakov, frowning. Don't cast a shadow here. In that case, apply leeches on her at least, and make me pray to God forever. The felcher flared up and shouted, Talk to me again, lump! Yakov also flared up and turned purple all over, but did not say a word, took Marfa by the arm and led her out of the waiting room. Only when they were already getting into the cart, he looked sternly and mockingly at the hospital and say, They put you artists here. I suppose you would do cupping on a rich man, but for a poor person, you are greedy to give a single leech. Herods! When they arrived home, Marfa entered the hut and stood for a moment, holding onto the stove. It seemed to her that if she lay down, Yakov would begin to complain about the losses and scold her for lying in bed all the time and not wanting to work. But Yakov looked at her with boredom and remembered that tomorrow was St. John the Theologian's Day and the day after tomorrow Nikolai the Wonder Workers. And then was Sunday and after that Monday, a hard day. For those four days, no work could be done, and Marfa would probably die on one of those days, so the coffin must be made today. He took his iron arshin, went up to the old woman, and took her measurements. Then she lay down, and Yakov crossed himself and began making a coffin. When the work was finished, Bronza put on his glasses and wrote in his book of losses. A coffin for Marfa Ivanova, two rubles, forty kopecks, and he sighed. The old woman lay silently with her eyes closed. Towards evening, when it got darker, she called the old man. Do you remember, Yakov? She said, looking at him joyfully. Do you remember how fifty years ago God gave us a baby with golden hair? You and I then sat by the river all the time and sang songs under the willow. Smiling bitterly, she added, The girl died. Yakov strained his memory but could not recall the baby or the willow. It's only in your imagination, he said. The priest came and administered the sacrament and extreme unction. 
Then Marfa began to mutter something incomprehensible and died by morning. The old women neighbors washed and dressed her and put her in a coffin. To avoid paying the deacon's fee, Yakov himself read the Psalter, and he paid nothing for the grave since the cemetery watchman was his compadre. For peasants carried the coffin to the cemetery, not for the money but out of respect. Old women, beggars and two cripples followed the coffin. The people they met on the road were crossing themselves devoutly. And Yakov was delighted that everything went so honest, decent and cheap and not offensive to anyone. When saying goodbye to Marfa for the last time, he touched the coffin with his hand and thought, Good job! But on the way back from the cemetery, he was taken by an intense melancholy. He felt unwell, his breathing was feverish and heavy, his legs were weak, and he was thirsty. All sorts of thoughts entered his head. He remembered again that he had never once pitied Marfa and never caressed her. Fifty-two years while they lived in the same hut dragged on for a long, long time. Yet in the whole of that eternity, he had never thought of her, never paid any attention to her, but treated her as if she were a cat or a dog. But every day she lighted the stove, cooked and baked, fetched water, chopped wood, slept with him on the same bed, and when he returned drunk from weddings, every time she reverently hung his violin on the wall and put him to bed. All this in silence with a timid, caring expression. Towards Yakov, Rothschild walked smiling and bowing. I'm looking for you, uncle, he said. Moisei Lyich bowed to you and asked you to come to them at once. Yakov was not up to it. He wanted to cry. Get off, he said, and went on. But how is it possible? Rothschild, alarmed, rushed in front of him. Moisei Lyich will be offended. They asked you to come at once. It seemed disgusting to Yakov that the Jew was out of his breath, blinking, and that he had so many red freckles. And it was repulsive to look at his green frock coat with dark patches and at this whole fragile, delicate figure. Why are you coming at me, garlic? Yakov shouted. Keep off! The Jew got angry and also shouted, But please be quiet, otherwise you will fly over my fence. Get out of my sight, Yakov roared and rushed at him with his fists. I have no peace with Jews. Rothschild was paralyzed with fear, sat down and waved his arms over his head as if defending himself from blows, then jumped up and ran away as fast as he could. As he was running, he jumped up and down and waved his arms, and you could see how his long, bony back trembled. The boys were delighted with the chance and rushed after him, shouting, Jew! Jew! The dogs also chased after him, barking. Someone laughed, then whistled. The dogs barked louder and all together. Then the dog must have bitten Rothschild because a desperate, painful cry was heard. Yakov walked around the pasture, then along the edge of the town without any purpose, and the boy shouted, Bronza is coming! Bronza is coming! And then there was the river. Sandpipers squealed and ducks quacked. The sun was hot, and there was such a sparkle from the water that it was painful to look at. Yakov walked along the shore, and he saw how a plump, red-cheeked lady came out of the swimming area, and he thought about her. Look at you, an other. Not far from the place for swimming, the boys were catching crayfish for meat, but seeing him, they began to shout with anger, Bronza! 
bronza. And there was a wild old willow tree with a vast hollow, with crow's nests on it. And suddenly, in Yakov's memory as if alive, a baby with golden hair appeared. And a willow that Marfa mentioned. Yes, this was it. The same willow, green, quiet, sad. How old it got, poor thing. He sat down under it and began to recall. On the other bank where there was now a water meadow, at that time, there was a large birch forest. And over there on that bold mountain, that can be seen on the horizon, then there was a blue, old, old pine forest. Barges were sailing on the river. And now everything is even and smooth. And on the other side, there is only a single birch tree, young and slender like a young lady. And on the river, there are only ducks and geese. And it does not seem that barges have ever sailed here. It appears that, unlike before, there are fewer geese. Yakov closed his eyes. And in his imagination, huge flocks of white geese flew toward each other. He wondered how it happened that in the last 40 or 50 years of his life, he had never been on the river. And if he was, he did not pay attention to it. After all, the river is decent, not small. Fishing could be done on it, and the fish could be sold to merchants, officials, and a barman at the station. And then the money could be put in a bank. It could be possible to sail in a boat from the estate to estate, playing the violin. And people of all ranks would pay money. Might as well try sailing barges. It's better than making coffins. Finally, it would be possible to breed geese, beat them, and send them to Moscow in winter. I suppose from the feathers alone I would have made as much as ten rubles a year. But he missed it. He did nothing. What a loss. Ah, oh, what a loss. And if he had done all together, caught fish, played on the violin, drove barges and beat geese, what a capital he would have collected. He had never even dreamed of this. Life had been wasted, without any satisfaction, wasted in vain. Everything had passed away unnoticed. There is nothing left before him, and when you look back, there is nothing but losses. Such losses that even thinking of them makes the blood run cold. And why a man can't live without these losses? Why in the world did they cut down the birch wood and the pine forest? Why is the common pasture unused? Why do people do what they ought not to do? Why did Yakov scold, growl, clench his fists and insult his wife all his life? For what purpose did he recently frighten and insult the Jew? Why don't people let each other live in peace? All this caused such a loss, terrible losses. If there were no hatred and malice, people would be able to draw valuable profit from one another. In the evening and at night, he dreamed of a baby, a willow, fish, the dead geese, and Marfa with a profile like that of a bird who wanted to drink. The pale, pathetic face of Rothschild and some muzzles were moving at him from all sides, muttering about losses. He shifted from side to side and got up from his bed about five times to play the violin. In the morning he got out of bed with an effort and went to the hospital. The same Maxim Nikolaevich ordered him to apply cold compress to his head, gave him powders, and by the expression on the doctor's face and by his tone, Yakov realized that everything was terrible and that no powders would make it any better. On the way home, he thought that he would only benefit from death. There would be no need to eat, 
drink, pay taxes, or injure others. And as a man lies in his grave not one year but hundreds and thousands of years, the profit was enormous. Man's life is a loss, and only his death is the benefit. Yet this idea is undoubtedly fair but still offensive and bitter. Why does this world have such a strange order when the life which is given to a person only once passes uselessly? He did not mind dying, but as soon as he arrived home and saw his violin, his heart clenched, and he felt sorry. You can't take the violin to the grave. It will be left so lonely. And the same thing would happen to it, as had happened to the birch wood and the pine forest. Everything in this world decays, and will decay. Yakov left the hut and sat down at the threshold, pressing his violin to his chest. Thinking about the wasted, unprofitable life, he played the violin, not knowing what, but it turned out plaintively and touchingly, and tears flowed down his cheeks. And the harder he thought, the sadder his violin cried. The latch creaked twice, and Rothschild appeared in the gate door. The first half of the yard he crossed boldly, but seeing Yakov, he suddenly stopped, crouched, and probably out of fear he began to make such movements with his hands as if he wanted to tell the time with his fingers. Come, don't be afraid said Yakov kindly, beckoning him. Come! Looking incredulously and with fear, he began to approach and stopped a few yards away from him. Please don't hit me, he said, squatting down. Moisei Lich has sent me again. Don't be afraid, he said. Go to Yakov again and tell him that without him we cannot possibly get on. The sh wedding is on Wednesday, yes. Shapovalov's daughter is marrying a wealthy man. It will be a rich wedding, added the Jew, squinting one eye. I can't, answered Yakov, breathing heavily. I'm ill, brother. And he played again, and the tears burst from his eyes and fell all over the violin. Rothschild listened attentively standing by his side with his arms crossed over the chest. The frightened, perplexed expression on his face gradually changed to mournful and suffering. He rolled his eyes as if experiencing excruciating delight and said, Wow! Tears slowly flowed down his cheeks and dripped onto a green frock coat. And after that, Yakov lay in bed all day long and anguished. When in the evening the priest, while confessing him, asked if Yakov remembered any particular scene behind him, Yakov, straining his weakening memory, again remembered the unfortunate face of Marfa and the desperate cry of a Jew who has been bitten by a dog. And Yakov said, in a hardly audible voice. Give the violin to Rothschild. All right, answered the priest. And now everyone in the town is asking, where did Rothschild get such an excellent violin? Did he buy it or steal it? Or did he get it as a pledge? Long ago he abandoned his flute and now only played the violin. From under his bow, the same mournful sounds are pouring out as in the past from a flute. But when he tries to repeat what Yakov played, when he sat on the threshold, the violin emits sounds so passionately sad and full of grief that the listeners weep. And he himself rolls his eyes and said, Wah! The town liked this new song so much that the merchants and officials invited Rothschild to their social gatherings and forced him to play it up to ten times. 
The End Anton Pavlovich Chekhov The Man in a Case At the furthest end of the village of Mironositska, some belated sportsmen lodged for the night in the elder Prokofi's barn. There were two of them, the veterinary surgeon Ivan Ivanovich and the schoolmaster Burkin. Ivan Ivanovich had a rather strange double-barreled surname, Chimsha Himalaisky, which did not suit him at all, and he was called simply Ivan Ivanovich all over the province. He lived at a stud farm near the town and had come out shooting now to get a breath of fresh air. Birkin, the high school teacher, stayed every summer at Count P and had been thoroughly at home in this district for years. They did not sleep. Ivan Ivanovich, a tall, lean old fellow with long mustaches, was sitting outside the door, smoking a pipe in the moonlight. Birkin was lying within on the hay and could not be seen in the darkness. They were telling each other all sorts of stories. Among other things, they spoke of the fact that the elder's wife Mavra, a healthy and by no means stupid woman, had never been beyond her native village, had never seen a town nor a railway in her life, and had spent the last ten years sitting behind the stove and only at night going out into the street. What is there wonderful in that? said Burkin. There are plenty of people in the world, solitary by temperament, who try to retreat in their shell like a hermit crab or a snail. Perhaps it is an instance of atavism, a return to the period when the ancestor of man was not yet a social animal and lived alone in his den. Or perhaps it is only one of the diversities of human character. Who knows? I'm not a natural science man, and it's not my business to settle such questions. I only mean to say that people like Mavra are not uncommon. There is no need to look far. Two months ago, a man called Belikov, a colleague of mine, the Greek master, died in our town. You have heard of him, no doubt. He was remarkable for always wearing galoshes and a warm, wetted coat and carrying an umbrella even in the very finest weather. And his umbrella was in a case, and his watch was in a case made of gray chamois leather. And when he took out his penknife to sharpen his pencil, his penknife, too, was in a little case. And his face seemed to be in a case, too, because he always hid it in his turned-up collar. He wore dark spectacles and flannel vests, stuffed up his ears with cotton wool, and when he got into a cab, always told the driver to put up the hood. In short, the man displayed a constant and insurmountable impulse to wrap himself in a covering, to make himself, so to speak, a case, which would isolate him and protect him from external influences. Reality irritated him, frightened him, keep him in continual agitation, and, perhaps to justify his timidity, his aversion for the actual, he always praised the past and what had never existed, and even the classical languages which he thought were, in reality for him, galoshes and umbrellas in which he sheltered himself from real life. Oh, how sonorous, how beautiful is the Greek language, he would say, with a sugary expression. And as though to prove his words, he would screw up his eyes and, raising his finger, would pronounce Antropos. And Belikov tried to hide his thoughts also in a case. The only things that were clear to his mind were government circulars and newspaper articles in which something was forbidden. When some proclamation prohibited the boys from going out in the streets after nine o'clock in the evening, or some article declared carnal love unlawful, it was to his mind clear and definite. It was forbidden, and that was enough. For him there was always a doubtful element. Something vague and not fully expressed, in any sanction or permission. When a dramatic club or a reading room or a tea shop was licensed in town, he would shake his head and say softly, 
It is all right, of course, it is all very nice, but I hope it won't lead to anything. Every sort of breach of order, deviation or departure from rule depressed him, though one would have thought it was no business of his. If one of his colleagues was late for church, or if rumors reached him of some prank of the high school boys, or one of the mistresses was seen late in the evening in the company of an officer, he was much disturbed and said he hoped that nothing would come of it. At the teachers' meetings he simply oppressed us with his caution, his circumspection, and his characteristic reflection on the ill behavior of the young people in both male and female high schools, the uproar in the classes. Oh, he hoped it would not reach the ears of the authorities. Oh, he hoped nothing would come of it. And he thought it would be a very good thing if Petrov were expelled from the second class and Yegorov from the fourth. And, do you know by his size, his despondency, his black spectacles on his pale little face, a little face like a polecat's, you know, he crushed us all, and we gave way, reduced Petrov's and Yegorov's marks for conduct, kept them in, and, in the end, expelled them both. He had a strange habit of visiting our lodgings. He would come to a teacher's, would sit down and remain silent, as though he were carefully inspecting something. He would sit like this in silence for an hour or two, and then go away. This he called maintaining good relations with his colleagues. And it was obvious that coming to see us and sitting there was tiresome to him, and that he came to see us simply because he considered it his duty as our colleague. We teachers were afraid of him. And even the headmaster was afraid of him. Would you believe it, our teachers were all intellectual, right-minded people, brought up on Turgenev and Shidrin, yet this little chap, who always went about with galoshes and an umbrella, had the whole high school under his thumb for fifteen long years. High school indeed, he had the whole town under his thumb. Our ladies did not get up private theatricals on Saturdays, for fear he should hear of it. And the clergy dared not eat meat or play cards in his presence. Under the influence of people like Belikov, we have got into the way of being afraid of everything in our town for the last ten or fifteen years. They are afraid to speak aloud, afraid to send letters, afraid to make acquaintances, afraid to read books, afraid to help the poor to teach people to read and write. Ivan Ivanovich cleared his throat, meaning to say something, but first lighted his pipe, gazed at the moon, and then said with pauses, Yes, intellectual, right-minded people read Shidrin and Turgenev, Buckle, and all the rest of them. Yet they knocked under and put up with it. That's just how it is. Belikov lived in the same house as I did, Burkin went on. On the same story, his door facing mine, we often saw each other, and I knew how he lived when he was at home. And at home, it was the same story. Dressing gown, nightcap, blinds, bolts, a perfect succession of prohibitions and restrictions of all sorts, and, oh, I hope nothing will come of it. Lent and fair was bad for him, yet he could not eat meat, as people might perhaps say Belikov did not keep the fasts, and he ate freshwater fish with butter. Not a Lenten dish, yet one could not say that it was meat. He did not keep a female servant, for fear people might think evil of him but had as cook an old man of sixty, called Afanasi, half-witted and given to tippling, who had once been an officer's servant and could cook after a fashion. This Afanasi, 
was usually standing at the door with his arms folded. With a deep sigh, he would mutter always the same thing. There are plenty of them about nowadays. Belikov had a little bedroom, like a box. His bed had curtains. When he went to bed, he covered his head over. It was hot and stuffy. The wind battered on the closed doors. There was a droning noise in the stove and a sound of sighs from the kitchen. Ominous sighs. And he felt frightened under the bedclothes. He was afraid that something might happen, that Afanasy might murder him, the thieves might break in, and so he had troubled dreams all night. And in the morning, when we went together to the high school, he was depressed and pale. And it was evident that the high school full of people excited dread and aversion in his whole being, and that to walk beside me was irksome to a man of his solitary temperament. They make a great noise in our classes, he used to say, as though trying to find an explanation for his depression. It's beyond anything. And the Greek master, this man in a case, would you believe it, almost got married. Ivan Ivanovich glanced quickly into the barn and said, You're joking. Yes, strange as it seems, he almost got married. A new teacher of history and geography, Mikhailo Savich Kavalenko, a little Russian, was appointed. He came not alone, but with his sister, Varinka. He was a tall, dark young man with huge hands, and one could see from his face that he had a bass voice, and, in fact, he had a voice that seemed to come out of a barrel. Boom, boom, boom. And she was not so young, about thirty, but she, too, was tall, well-made, with black eyebrows and red cheeks. In fact, she was a regular sugar plum, and so sprightly, so noisy, she was always singing little Russian songs and laughing. For the least thing, she would go off into a ringing laugh. Ha 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 ha! We made our first thorough acquaintance with the Kvalenkos at the headmaster's name day party. Among the glum and intensely bored teachers who came even to the name day party as a duty, we suddenly saw a new Aphrodite risen from the waves. She walked with her arms akimbo, laughed, sang, danced. She sang with feeling the winds to blow, then another song and another, and she fascinated us all. All, even Belikov. He sat down by her and said with a honeyed smile, The little Russian reminds one of the ancient Greek in its softness and agreeable resonance. That flattered her and she began telling him with feeling and earnestness that they had a farm in the Gadetsky district, and that her mama lived at the farm, and that they had such pears, such melons, such kabaks, the little Russians called pumpkins kabaks. While they are pothouses, they call shinki, and they make a beetroot soup with tomatoes and aubergines in it which was so nice, awfully nice. We listened and listened, and suddenly the same idea dawned upon us all. It would be a good thing to make a match of it, the headmaster's wife said to me softly. We all, for some reason, recalled the fact that our friend Belikov was not married, and it now seemed to us strange that we had hitherto failed to observe and had, in fact, completely lost sight of a detail so important in his life. What was his attitude to women? How had he settled this vital question for himself? Perhaps we had not even admitted the idea that a man who went out in all weathers in galoshes and slept under curtains could be in love. He's a good deal over forty, 
and she is 30. The headmaster's wife went on developing the idea. I believe she would marry him. All sorts of things are done in the provinces through boredom. All sorts of unnecessary and nonsensical things. And that is because what is necessary is not done at all. What need was there, for instance, for us to make a match for this Belikov, whom one could not even imagine married? The headmaster's wife, the inspector's wife, and all our high school ladies grew livelier and even better looking, as though they had suddenly found a new object in life. The headmaster's wife would take a box at the theater, and we beheld sitting in her box Varinka with such a fan beaming and happy, and beside her Belikov, a little bent figure looking as though he had been extracted from his house by pincers. I would give an evening party, and the ladies would insist on my inviting Belikov and Varenka. In short, the machine was set in motion. It appeared that Varenka was not averse to matrimony. She had not a very cheerful life with her brother. They could do nothing but quarrel and scold one another from morning till night. Here is a scene, for instance. Kavalenko would be coming along the street, a tall, sturdy young ruffian in an embroidered shirt, his love locks falling off his forehead under his cap, in one hand a bundle of books, in the other a thick knotted stick, followed by his sister, also with books in her hand. But you have not read it, Mihalik, she would be arguing loudly. I tell you, I swear you have not read it all. And I tell you I have read it, cries Kavalenko, thumping his stick on the pavement. Oh, my goodness, Mihalik, why are you so cross? We are arguing about principles. I tell you that I have read it, Kavalenko would shout more loudly than ever. And at home, if there was an outsider present, there was sure to be skirmish. Such a life must have been wearisome. And, of course, she must have longed for a home of her own. Besides, there was her age to be considered. There was no time left to pick and choose. It was a case of marrying anybody, even a Greek master. And, indeed, most of our young ladies don't mind whom they marry so long as they do get married. However, that may be, Varinka began to show an unmistakable partiality for Belikov. And Belikov, he used to visit Kavalenko just as he did us. He would arrive, sit down, and remain silent. He would sit quiet, and Varenka would sing to him, The winds do blow, or would look pensively at him with her dark eyes, or would suddenly go off into a peal. Ha 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 ha! Suggestion plays a great part in love affairs, and still more in getting married. Everybody both his colleagues and the ladies, began assuring Belikov that he ought to get married, that there was nothing left for him in life but to get married. We all congratulated him with solemn countenances, delivered ourselves of various platitudes, such as marriage is a serious step. Besides, Farinka was good-looking and interesting, she was the daughter of a civil counselor and had a farm. And what was more, she was the first woman who had been warm and friendly in her manner to him. His head was turned, and he decided that he really ought to get married. Well, at that point you ought to have taken away his galoshes and umbrella, said Ivan Ivanovich. Only fancy. That turned out to be impossible. He put Varinka's portrait on his table, kept coming to see me and talking about Varinka and home life, saying marriage was a serious step. He was frequently at Kavalenko's, but he did not alter his manner of life in the least. On the contrary, indeed, his determination to get married seemed to have a depressing effect on him. He grew thinner and paler and seemed to retreat further and further into his case. I like Varvara Savishna, he used to say to me, 
with a faint and wry smile. And I know that everyone ought to get married, but, you know, all this has happened so suddenly. One must think a little. What is there to think over? I used to say to him. Get married, that's all. No, marriage is a serious step. One must first weigh the duties before one, the responsibilities, that nothing may go wrong afterwards. It worries me so much that I don't sleep at night. And I must confess, I am afraid. Her brother and she have a strange way of thinking. They look at things strangely, you know. And her disposition is very impetuous. One may get married and then there is no knowing. One may find oneself in an unpleasant position. And he did not make an offer. He kept putting it off to the great vexation of the headmaster's wife and all our ladies. He went on weighing his future duties and responsibilities, and meanwhile he went for a walk with Varinka almost every day. Possibly he thought that this was necessary in his position, and came to see me to talk about family life. And in all probability, in the end, he would have proposed to her and would have made one of those unnecessary, stupid marriages such are made by thousands among us from being bored and having nothing to do. If it had not been for a colossal scandal. I must mention that Varinka's brother, Kovalenko, detested Belikov from the first day of their acquaintance and could not endure him. I don't understand, he used to say to us, shrugging his shoulders. I don't understand how you can put up with that sneak, that nasty fizz. Ah, how can you live here? The atmosphere is stifling and unclean. Do you call yourselves schoolmasters, teachers? You're paltry government clerks. You keep not a temple of science but a department for red tape and loyal behavior, and it smells as sour as a police station. No, my friends, I will stay with you for a while, and then I will go to my farm, and there catch crabs and teach the little Russians. I shall go, and you can stay here with your Judas, damn his soul. Or he would laugh till he cried first in a loud bass, then in a shrill, thin laugh, and ask me, waving his hands, what does he sit here for? What does he want? He sits and stares. He even gave Belikov a nickname, the spider. And that it will readily be understood that we avoided talking to him of his sisters being about to marry the spider. And on the occasion, when the headmaster's wife hinted to him what a good thing it would be to secure his sister's future with such a reliable, universally respected man as Belikov, he frowned and muttered, It's not my business. Let her marry a reptile, if she likes. I don't like meddling in other people's affairs. Now hear what happened next. Some mischievous person drew a caricature of Belikov walking along in his galoshes with his trousers tucked up under his umbrella with Varinka on his arm. Below the inscription, Anthropos in love. The expression was caught to a marvel, you know. The artist must have worked for more than one night for the teachers of both the boys' and girls' high schools, the teachers of the seminary, the government officials all received a copy. Belikov received one too. The caricature made a very painful impression on him. We went out together. It was the 1st of May, a Sunday, and all of us, the boys and the teachers, had agreed to meet at the high school and then go for a walk together to a wood beyond the town. We set off, and he was green in his face and gloomier than a storm cloud. What wicked, ill-natured people there are, he said, and his lip quivered. 
I felt sorry for him. We were walking along and all of a sudden, would you believe it, Kavalenko came bowling along on a bicycle, and after him, also on a bicycle, Varinka, flushed and exhausted, but good-humored and gay. We're going on ahead, she called. What lovely weather, awfully lovely. And they both disappeared from our sight. Belikov turned white instead of green and seemed petrified. He stopped short and stared at me. What is the meaning of it? Tell me, please, he asked. Can my eyes have deceived me? Is it the proper thing for high school masters and ladies to ride bicycles? What is there improper about it, I said. Let them ride and enjoy themselves. But how can that be, he cried, amazed at my calm. What are you saying? And he was so shocked that he was unwilling to go on and returned home. Next day he was continually twitching and nervously rubbing his hands, and it was evident from his face that he was unwell. And he left before his work was over for the first time in his life, and he ate no dinner. Towards evening he wrapped himself up warmly, though it was quite warm weather, and sallied out to the Kavalenkos. Varinka was out. He found her brother, however. Pray sit down, Kavalenko said coldly with a frown. His face looked sleepy. He had just had a nap after dinner and was in a very bad humor. Belikov sat in silence for ten minutes and then began. I have come to see you to relieve my mind. I'm very, very much troubled. Some scurrilous fellow has drawn an absurd caricature of me and another person in whom we are both deeply interested. I regard it as a duty to assure you that I have had no hand in it. I have given no sort of ground for such ridicule. On the contrary, I have always behaved in every way like a gentleman. Kavalenko sat sulky and silent. Belikov waited a little and went on slowly in a mournful voice. And I have something else to say to you. I have been in the service for years, while you have only lately entered it, and I consider it my duty as an older colleague to give you a warning. You ride on a bicycle and that pastime is utterly unsuitable for an educator of youth. Why so? asked Kavalenko in his base. Surely that needs no explanation, Mikhail Savich. Surely you can understand that. If the teacher rides a bicycle, what can you expect the pupils to do? You will have them walking on their heads next. And, so long as there is no formal permission to do so, it is out of the question. I was horrified yesterday. When I saw your sister, everything seemed dancing before my eyes. A lady or a young girl on a bicycle, it's awful. What is it you want, exactly? All I want is to warn you, Mikhail Savich. You are a young man. You have a future before you. You must be very, very careful in your behavior. And you are so careless, oh, so careless. You go about in an embroidered shirt, are constantly seen in the street carrying books, and now the bicycle, too. The headmaster will learn that you and your sister ride the bicycle and then it will reach the higher authorities. Will that be a good thing? It's no business of anybody else if my sister and I do bicycle, said Kavalenko, and he turned crimson. And damnation take anyone who meddles in my private affairs. Belikov turned pale and got up. If you speak to me in that tone, I cannot continue he said. 
And I beg you never to express yourself like that about our superiors. In my presence, you ought to be respectful to the authorities. Why have I said any harm of the authorities? asked Kavalenko, looking at him wrathfully. Please leave me alone. I am an honest man and do not care to talk to a gentleman like you. I don't like sneaks. Belikov flew into a nervous flutter and began hurriedly putting on his coat with an expression of horror on his face. It was the first time in his life he had been spoken to so rudely. You can say what you please, he said, as he went out from the entry to the landing on the staircase. I ought only to warn you. Possibly someone may have overheard us, and that our conversation may not be misunderstood and harm come of it, I shall be compelled to inform our headmaster of our conversation in its main features. I am bound to do so. Inform him, you can go and make your report. Kavalenko seized him from behind by the collar and gave him a push, and Belikov rolled downstairs, thudding with his galoshes. The staircase was high and steep, but he rolled to the bottom unheard, got up and touched his nose to see whether his spectacles were all right. But just as he was falling down the stairs, Varinka came in and with her two ladies. They stood below staring, and to Belikov this was more terrible than anything. I believe he would rather have broken his neck or both legs than have been an object of ridicule. Why, now the whole town would hear of it, it would come to the headmaster's ears, would reach the higher authorities. Oh, it might lead to something. There would be another caricature, and it would all end up in his being asked me to resign this post. When he got up, Varinka recognized him, and looking at his ridiculous face, his crumpled overcoat and his galoshes, not understanding what had happened and supposing that he had slipped down by accident, could not restrain herself and laughed loud enough to be heard by all the flats. Ha 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 And this peeling, ringing ha ha ha, was the last straw that put an end to everything, to the proposed match and to Belikov's earthly existence. He did not hear what Varinka said to him, he saw nothing. On reaching home, the first thing he did was to remove her portrait from the table. Then he went to bed, and he never got up again. Three days later, Afanasi came to me and asked whether we should not send for the doctor, as there was something wrong with his master. I went in to Belikov. He lay silent, behind the curtain, covered with a quilt. If one asked him a question, he said yes or no, and not another sound. He lay there while Afanasi, gloomy and scowling, hovered about him, sighing heavily and smelling like a pothouse. A month later, Belikov died. We all went to his funeral, that is, both the high schools and the seminary. Now, when he was lying in his coffin, his expression was mild, agreeable, even cheerful, as though he were glad that he had at last been put into a case which he would never leave again. Yes, he had attained his ideal. And as though in his honor it was dull, rainy weather on the day of his funeral, and we all wore galoshes and took our umbrellas. Varinka, too, was at the funeral, and when the coffin was lowered into the grave, she burst into tears. I have noticed that little Russian women are always laughing or crying, no intermediate mood. One must confess that to bury people like Belikov is a great pleasure. As we were returning from the cemetery, we wore discreet lantern faces, 
No one wanted to display this feeling of pleasure. A feeling like that we had experienced long, long ago as children, when our elders had gone out and we ran about the garden for an hour or two, enjoying complete freedom. Ah, freedom, freedom. The merest hint, the faintest hope of its possibility, gives wings to the soul, does it not? We returned from the cemetery in a good humor. But not more than a week had passed before life went on as in the past, as gloomy, oppressive, and senseless. A life not forbidden by government prohibition, but not fully permitted, either. It was no better. And indeed, though we had buried Belikov, how many such men in cases were left? How many more of them there will be? That's just how it is, said Ivan Ivanovich, and he lighted his pipe. How many more of them there will be, repeated Borkin. The schoolmaster came out of the barn. He was a short, stout, completely bald, with a black beard down to his waist. The two dogs came out with him. What a moon, he said, looking upwards. It was midnight. On the right could be seen the whole village, a long street stretching far away for four miles. All was buried in deep, silent slumber. Not a movement, not a sound. One could hardly believe that nature could be so still. When on a moonlight night you see a broad village street, with its cottages, haystacks, and slumbering willows, a feeling of calm comes over the soul. In this peace, wrapped away from care, toil, and sorrow in the darkness of night, it is mild, melancholy, beautiful, and it seems as though the stars look down upon it kindly and with tenderness, and as though there were no evil on earth and all were well. On the left the open country began from the end of the village, it could be seen stretching far away to the horizon, and there was no movement, no sound, in that whole expanse bathed in moonlight. Yes, that is just how it is, repeated Ivan Ivanovich. And is not our living in town, airless and crowded, our writing useless papers, our playing wind, isn't that all a sort of a case for us? And our spending our whole lives among trivial, fussy men and silly idle women, our talking and our listening to all sorts of nonsense, isn't that a case for us too? If you like, I will tell you a very edifying story. No, it's time we were asleep, said Burkin. Tell it tomorrow. They went into the barn and lay down on the hay and they were both covered up and beginning to doze when they suddenly heard light footsteps. Patter, patter. Someone was walking not far from the barn, walking a little and stopping, and a minute later, patter, patter again. The dogs began growling. That's Mavra, said Burkin. The footsteps died away. You see and hear that they lie, said Ivan Ivanovich, turning over on the other side. And they call you a fool for putting up with their lying. You endure insult and humiliation, and dare not openly say that you are on the side of the honest and the free, and you lie, and smile yourself, and all that for sake of a crust of bread, for the sake of a warm corner, for the sake of a wretched little worthless rank in the service. No, one can't go on living like this. Well, you're off on another track now, Ivan Ivanovich, said the schoolmaster. Let us go to sleep. And ten minutes later, Burkin was asleep. But Ivan Ivanovich kept sighing and turning over from side to side. Then he got up went outside again and, sitting in the doorway, lighted his pipe.
Антон Павлович Чехов Sleepy Night Варка, the little nurse, a girl of thirteen, is rocking the cradle in which the baby is lying and humming hardly audibly. I shall buy my baby wee while I sing a song for thee. A little green lamp is burning before the icon. There is a string stretched from one end of the room to the other, on which baby clothes and a pair of big black trousers are hanging. There is a big patch of green on the ceiling from the icon lamp, and the baby clothes and the trousers throw long shadows on the stove, on the cradle, and on Varka. When the lamp begins to flicker, the green patch and the shadows come to life and are set in motion, as though by the wind. It is stuffy. There is a smell of cabbage soup and of the inside of a boot shop. The baby is crying. For a long while he has been hoarse and exhausted with crying, but he still goes on screaming, and there is no knowing when he will stop. And Varka is sleepy. Her eyes are glued together, her head droops, her neck aches. She cannot move her eyelids or her lips, and she feels as though her face is dried and wooden, as though her head has become as small as the head of a pin. Hush up, my baby, we, she hums, while I cook the groats for thee. A cricket is churring in the stove. Through the door in the next room, the master and the apprentice of Anasi are snoring. The cradle creaks plaintively. Varka murmurs, and it all blends into that soothing music of the night to which it is so sweet to listen when one is lying in bed. Now that music is merely irritating and oppressive because it goads her to sleep, and she must not sleep. If Varka, God forbid, should fall asleep, her master and mistress would beat her. The lamp flickers. The patch of green and the shadows are set in motion, forcing themselves on Varka's fixed half-open eyes, and in her half-slumbering brain are fashioned into misty visions. She sees dark clouds chasing one another over the sky and screaming like the baby. But then the wind blows, the clouds are gone, and Varka sees a broad high road covered with liquid mud, Along the high road stretch files of wagons, while people with wallets on their backs are trudging along, and shadows flit backwards and forwards. On both sides she can see forests through the cold, harsh mist. All at once the people with their wallets and their shadows fall on the ground in the liquid mud. What is that for? Varka asks. To sleep, to sleep, they answer her and they fall sound asleep, and sleep sweetly, while crows and magpies sit on the telegraph wires, scream like the baby, and try to wake them. I shall buy my baby we, and I will sing a song to thee, murmurs Varka, and now she sees herself in a dark stuffy hut. Her dead father, Yefim Stepanov, is tossing from side to side on the floor. She doesn't see him, but she hears him moaning and rolling on the floor from pain. His guts have burst, as he says. The pain is so violent that he cannot utter a single word and can only draw in his breath and clack his teeth like the rattling of a drum. Boo, 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 boo. Her mother, Pelageya, has run to the master's house to say that Yefim is dying. She has been gone a long time and ought to be back. Barka lies awake on the stove and hears her father's boo, boo, boo. And then she hears someone has driven up to the hut. It is a young doctor from the town who has been sent from the big house where he is staying on a visit. The doctor comes into the hut he cannot be seen in the darkness, but he can be heard coughing and rattling the door. Light a candle, he says. Boo, 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 answers Yefim. 
Pelagea rushes to the stove and begins looking for the broken pot with the matches. A minute passes in silence. The doctor, feeling in his pocket, lights a match. In a minute, sir, in a minute, says Pelagea. She rushes out of the hut and soon afterwards comes back with a bit of a candle. Yefim's cheeks are rosy and his eyes are shining and there is a peculiar keenness in his glance, as though he were seeing right through the hut and the doctor. Come, what is it? What are you thinking about? says the doctor, bending down to him. Aha, have you had this long? What? Dying, your honor. My hour has come. I'm not to stay among the living. Don't talk nonsense. We will cure you. That's as you please, your honor. We humbly thank you, only we understand. Since death has come, there it is. The doctor spends a quarter of an hour over Yefim. Then he gets up and says, I can do nothing. You must go into the hospital. There they will operate on you. Go at once. You must go. It's rather late. They will all be asleep in the hospital. But that doesn't matter. I will give you a note. Do you hear? Kind sir. But what can he go in? Says Pelagea. We have no horse. Never mind. I'll ask your master. He'll let you have a horse. The doctor goes away. The candle goes out. And again there is the sound of boo, boo, boo. Half an hour later someone drives up to the hut. A cart has been sent to take Yefim to the hospital. He gets ready and goes. But now it is a clear bright morning. Pelagea is not at home. She has gone to the hospital to find what is being done to Yefim. Somewhere there is a baby crying, and Varka hears someone singing with her own voice. I shall buy my baby wee, I will sing a song for thee. Pelagia comes back. She crosses herself and whispers. They put him to right in the night, but towards morning he gave up his soul to God. The kingdom of heaven be his and peace everlasting. They say he was taken too late. He ought to have gone sooner. Varka goes out in the road and cries there. But all at once someone hits her on the back of her head, so hard that her forehead knocks against a birch tree. She raises her eyes and sees facing her her master, the shoemaker. What are you about, you scabby slut? he says. The child is crying, and you're asleep. He gives her a sharp slap behind the ear, and she shakes her head, rocks the cradle, and murmurs her song. The green patch and the shadows from the trousers and the baby clothes move up and down, nod to her, and soon take possession of her brain again. Again she sees the high road covered with liquid mud. The people with wallets on their backs and the shadows have lain down and are fast asleep. Looking at them, Varka has a passionate longing for sleep. She would lie down with enjoyment. But her mother Pelagea is walking beside her, hurrying her on. They are hastening together to the town to find situations. Give alms! For Christ's sake, her mother begs of the people they meet. Show us the divine mercy, kind-hearted gentlefolk. Give the baby here, a familiar voice answers. Give the baby here, the same voice repeats, this time harshly and angrily. Are you asleep, you wretched girl? Varka jumps up and looking round grasps what is the matter. There is no high road. No Pelagea, no people meeting them. There is only her mistress, who has come to feed the baby, and is standing in the middle of the room. While the stout, broad-shouldered woman nurses the child and soothes it. Varka stands looking at her and waiting till she has done. And outside the windows the air is already turning blue. The shadows and the green patch on the ceiling are visibly growing pale. It will soon be morning. Take him, says her mistress, buttoning up her chemise over her bosom. He is crying. He must be bewitched. Varka takes the baby, 
puts him in a cradle and begins rocking it again. The green patch in the shadows gradually disappear, and now there is nothing to force itself on her eyes and cloud her brain. But she is as sleepy as before. Fearfully sleepy. Varka lays her head on the edge of the cradle and rocks her whole body to overcome her sleepiness, but yet her eyes are glued together and her head is heavy. Barka hit the stove! She hears the master's voice through the door. So it is time to get up and set to work. Varka leaves the cradle and runs to the shed for firewood. She is glad. When one moves and runs about, one is not so sleepy as when one is sitting down. She brings the wood, hits the stove, and feels that her wooden face is getting supple again, and that her thoughts are growing clearer. Varka set the samovar, shouts her mistress. Varka splits a piece of wood, but has scarcely time to light the splinters and put them in the samovar when she hears a fresh order. Varka, clean the master's galoshes! She sits down on the floor, cleans the galoshes, and thinks how nice it would be put her head into a big, deep galosh and have a little nap in it. And all at once the galosh grows, swells, fills up the whole room. Barka drops the brush, but at once shakes her head, opens her eyes wide, and tries to look at things so that they may not grow big and move before her eyes. Barka, wash the steps outside. I'm ashamed for the customers to see them. Barka washes the steps, sweeps and dusts the rooms, then heats another stove and runs to the shop. There is a great deal of work. She has not one minute free. But nothing is so hard as standing in the same place at the kitchen table peeling potatoes. Her head droops over the table. The potatoes dance before her eyes. The knife tumbles out of her hand while her fat, angry mistress is moving about near her with her sleeves tucked up talking so loud that it makes a ringing in Varka's ears. It is agonizing, too. To wait at dinner, to wash, to sew, there are minutes when she longs to flop onto the floor, regardless of everything, and to sleep. The day passes. Seeing the windows getting dark, Varka presses her temples that feel as though they were made of wood, and smiles though she does not know why. The dusk of evening caresses her eyes that will hardly keep open and promises her sound sleep soon. In the evening visitors come. Varka set the samovar, shouts her mistress. The samovar is a little one, and before the visitor have drunk all the tea they want, she has to heat it five times. After tea, Varka stands for a whole hour on the same spot, looking at the visitors and waiting for orders. Varka, run and buy three bottles of beer! She starts off and tries to run as quickly as she can to drive away sleep. Varka, fetch some vodka! Varka, where's the corkscrew? Varka, clean a herring! But now at last the visitors have gone. The lights are put out. The master and mistress go to bed. Varka, rock the baby! She hears the last order. The cricket chores in the stove. The green patch on the ceiling and the shadows from the trousers and the baby clothes force themselves on Varka's half-opened eyes again, wink at her and cloud her mind. How shall buy my baby we? She murmurs. And I will sing a song to thee. And the baby screams, and is worn out with screaming. Again, Varka sees the muddy high road, the people with wallets, her mother Pelagea, her father Yefim. She understands everything. She recognizes everyone. But through her half-sleep she cannot understand the force which binds her. Hand and foot weighs upon her and prevents her from living. She looks round, searches for that force that she may escape from it, but she cannot find it. At last, tired to death, she does her very utmost, 
strains her eyes, looks up at the flickering green patch and, listening to the screaming, finds the foe who will not let her leave. That foe is the baby. She laughs. It seems strange to her that she has failed to grasp such a simple thing before. The green patch, the shadows, and the cricket seem to laugh and wonder too. The hallucination takes possession of Varka. She gets up from her stool, and with a broad smile on her face and wide unblinking eyes, she walks up and down the room. She feels pleased and tickled at the thought that she will be rid directly of the baby that binds her hand and foot. Kill the baby. And then sleep, sleep, sleep. Laughing and winking and shaking her fingers at the green patch, Varka steals up to the cradle and bends over the baby. When she has strangled him, she quickly lies down on the floor, laughs with delight that she can sleep, and in a minute is sleeping as sound as the dead. Anton Pavlovich Chekhov A Conversation of a Drunk with a Sober Imp The former official of a quartermaster's office, a retired collegiate secretary Lakhmatov, was sitting at his desk and drinking his sixteenth shot, pondering about brotherhood, equality and freedom. Suddenly, an imp looked out at him from behind the lamp. But don't be frightened, a reader. Do you know what an imp is? It's a young man of pleasant appearance, with a mug as black as boots and red expressive eyes. On his head, despite he is not married, there are little horns. Hairstyle a la capul. The body is covered with green hair and smells like a dog. Down the back a tail dangling, ending in an arrow. Instead of fingers, claws. Instead of legs, horse hooves. Lakhmatov, when he saw the imp, got somewhat embarrassed, but then, remembering that green imps have a stupid habit of appearing to all drunk people in general, soon calmed down. Who do I have the honor to speak to? He turned to the uninvited guest. The imp got embarrassed and lowered his eyes. Don't be shy, Lakhmatov continued. Come closer. I'm a man without prejudice, and you can speak to me sincerely, from heart. Who are you? The devil hesitantly approached Lakhmatov and, tucking his tail under him, bowed politely. I'm the imp or the devil, he introduced himself. I'm an official for special assignments under the person of His Excellency, the director of the infernal office of Mr. Satan. I've heard, I've heard, very nice. Sit down, would you like vodka? Very glad. And what do you do? The imp got even more embarrassed. Actually, I don't have any specific occupations, he answered, coughing in embarrassment and blowing his nose into rebus. Before, indeed, we had an occupation. We tempted people, seduced them from the way of good to the path of evil. Now this occupation, entre nous soit dit, is not worth a spit. There is no longer a way of good. There is nothing to tempt from. And besides, people have become more cunning than us. How can you tempt a person who already went through fire, water and copper pipes while attending the university? How can I teach you how to steal a ruble if you have already grabbed thousands without my help? That's right. But still, you're doing something, aren't you? Yes. Our former position can now only be a commemorative one, but we still have work. We tempt gymnasium ladies, push youngsters writing poetry, 
force drunken merchants to smash mirrors. Into politics, literature, and science we have long not interfered. We don't know a damn thing about this. Many of us, copyright and rebels, there are even those who dumped hell and entered humankind. These retired imps who entered humankind married rich merchants and now live excellently. Some of them are engaged in advocacy, others publish newspapers, generally very efficient and respected people. Forgive me for asking an indelicate question. What allowance do you receive? Our position is the same, the imp replied. The staff has not changed at all. The same as before, the apartment, electricity and heating are state-owned. We don't get paid because we are all considered freelancers and because imp is an honorary profession. In general, frankly speaking, life is bad, almost needed to go and beg for money. Thanks to the people, they taught us to take bribes. Otherwise, we would have been broken a long time ago. We only live on earnings. We supply sinners with provisions and, well, still, Satan got old, goes to see Zuki all the time and has no time to report. Lakhmatov poured a shot of vodka for the imp. He drank and got into talking. He told all the secrets of hell, poured out his soul and shed tears. So Lakhmatov liked him so much that he even let him spend the night at his place. The devil slept inside the stove and raved all night. By morning, he disappeared. The End Anton Pavlovich Chekhov Life in Questions and Exclamations Childhood Who did God give, a son or a daughter? When is the christening? A big boy? Mommy, don't drop! Ah, ah, we'll fall! Have teeth erupted? Is it scrofula he has? Take the cat from him, it'll scratch him. Pull, uncle, by the mustache. Okay, don't cry. Brownie's coming. He's already able to walk. Take him away from here, he's impolite. What did he do to you? Poor frock coat. Well, never mind, we'll get it dry. He upset the ink. Go to sleep, Bubble. He is already talking. Oh, what a joy. Come on, say something. He was nearly run over by cabbies. Get rid of the nanny. Don't stand in the draft. Shame on you, how could you hit such a little one? Don't cry. Give him a gingerbread. Adolescence. Come here, I'll flog you. Where did you smash your nose? Don't bother, Mom. You're not a toddler. Don't come to the table, you turn after. Read. You don't know? Go and stand in the corner. Low is great. Don't put nails in the pocket. Why won't you listen to what Mom says? Eat properly. Don't pick your nose. Did you hit me, Ta? Nimble. Read me Dimyanov's fish soup. What is the nominative plural? Add and subtract. Get out of the classroom. No lunch. It's time to sleep. It's nine o'clock already. He only plays pranks when we have visitors. You're lying. Calm your hair. Get out of the table. Come on, show me your grades. Already torn the boots? It's a shame to cry when you are that big. Where did you get the uniform dirty? It's never going to be enough for you. 
the law was great again? When will I finally stop smacking you? If you're going to smoke, then I'll throw you out of the house. What is the superlative of facilis? Facilissimus? You lie. Who drank this wine? Children? They brought a monkey to the yard. What did you hold back my son and other great for? Grandma came. Youth. You're too young to drink vodka. Tell me about the sequence of tenses. Not yet, not yet, young man. At your age, I knew nothing at all about that. Are you still afraid to smoke in front of your father? Oh, what a shame! Ninochka sends her best. Take Julius Caesar. Is this the ad consecutivum? Oh, sweetheart. Don't, sir, or else I'll tell papa. Well, well, rouge. Bravo, my mustache is already growing. Where? You drew that on, it's not growing. Nadine has a charming chin. What class are you in now? You must agree, Papa, that it's unacceptable for me not to have pocket money. Natasha? I know. I've been at hers. So it's you? You're a humble one. Let me smoke. Ah, uh, if you only knew how much I love her. She's a goddess. I'll finish my course at the gymnasium and marry her. It's none of your business, maman. I dedicate my poems to you. Leave to smoke for me. I get drunk after three shots. Bees, bees, bravo! How come you have not read born? Not cosine, but sine. Where's the tangent? Sonia does not have pretty legs. May I kiss? Shall we drink? Hooray! Finish the course! Right after me. Lend me a quarter. Father, I'm getting married. But I gave a word. Where did you spend the night? Between twenty and thirty years old. Lend me one hundred rubles. What faculty? I don't care. How much is the lecture? Cheap, though. To Strelna and back. Bis, bis. How much do I owe you? Come tomorrow. What's in the theater today? If only you knew how much I love you. Yes or no? Yes? Oh, my sweetheart. Threw me out. Man, do you drink sherry? Maria, bring me some pickled cucumber juice. Is the editor home? Have I no talent? Strange. What will I live on? Lend me five rubles. To le salon. Gentlemen, the day is breaking. I dumped her. Lend me a tailcoat. The yellow one in the corner. I'm already drunk. I'm dying, doctor. Lend me to get the medicine. Nearly died. Have I lost weight? Two yar, huh? Worth it. Give me work, please. Ha, huh, you're lazy. How can one be so late? It's not about the money. No, it's about the money. I'm shooting myself, that's all. The hell with everything. Adieu, miserable life. Well, not yet. Is that you, Lisa? My song is sung, ma'am. My life is over. Give me the place, uncle. My tongue, the carriage is ready. Merci, mon oncle. Don't you think I've changed, mon oncle? Shape shifted. Ha <laughs> ha, write this paper. Mary, never. She, alas, is married. Your Excellency. 
Introduce me to your grandmother, Serge. You are enchanting, princess. Old nonsense. You are fishing for compliments. Let me a seat in the second row. Between thirty and fifty years old. Fell off. Is there a vacancy? Nine no trumps. Seven of clubs. Your turn to deal. Votre excellence. You are terrible, doctor. Do I have fatty liver? Nonsense. How much this doctor's charge? How much is her dowry? You don't love her now, but in time you'll love. Congrats on legal marriage. I can't, my lovely, not gamble. Gastric catar? A son or a daughter? Looks like his father. <laughs> I didn't know. I won, my sweetheart. Damn it, I've lost again. A son or a daughter? Looks like his father. I swear, I don't know her. Stop being jealous. Let's go, Fanny. A bracelet? Champagne! To the promotion! Merci? What to do to lose weight? Am I bold? Don't nag, mother-in-law. A son or a daughter? I'm drunk, Caroline Hen. Let me kiss you, Fräulein. A gun that bastard at my wife's. How many children do you have? Help the poor man. What a lovely daughter you have. They devils printed it in the papers. Come, I'll flog you, nasty boy. Was it you who wrinkled my wig? Old age. Are we going to resort? Marry him, my daughter. Stupid. Enough. She dances badly, but her legs are lovely. A hundred rubles for a kiss? Ah, you little devil. He, he, he. Want a grouse, girl? You, son, are, well, immoral. You have forgotten your manners, young man. Psst, psst, psst. I l love music. Sham, sham, champagne. Are you reading Jester? He, he, he. I bring candy for the grandchildren. My son is excellent, but I was better. Where are you, the time? I have not forgotten you either, Emochka, in my will. See how I am. Daddy, give me the watch. Edima? Really? Rest in peace. Relatives crying. Morning is coming to them. He smells. Peace to your ashes, honest toiler. The End